And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. From time to time, we like to visit universities so that we can talk with professors who are also authors. And today we are on location at UCLA. And joining us is Professor Lane Hirabayashi, who is the author of this book, A Principled Stand, a story of Hirabayashi versus the United States. Now, there's a court case here that you mentioned that has the same last name as you. What's your relationship to Gordon Bay Hirabayashi? Absolutely. Um, it's a well-known court case, and Gordon is my uncle. Uh, he came from a family with five siblings, and my father, James, was the middle kid, and Gordon was the eldest son. Who was Gordon Hirabayashi? Well, that's uh, a multifaceted, uh, that will take a multifaceted uh, answer. For much of his life, he was a sociology professor at the University of Al Alberta in Edmonton, Canada and that was the bulk of his professional career. But he actually came into the limelight as a 24-year-old University of Washington student. Uh, he was amongst a handful of people that felt that the curfew against not only Japanese uh, following Pearl Harbor, but also Japanese Americans, uh, including himself. He was a U.S. citizen. Uh, the curfew applied not only to the alien parents, alien I might uh, add because they were ineligible to become naturalized U.S. citizens, but I think that Gordon thought of himself as an American, and so when the curfew applied not only to the uh, Issei parents, but also to second generation Japanese Americans like himself, uh, he objected very much to that. What he, was the curfew, Professor? The curfew uh, came at the order of uh, General John DeWitt and the Western Defense Command. After Pearl Harbor, uh, understandably, I think they needed, uh, they felt a need to secure uh, port areas, Seattle, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, these kinds of areas, uh, as well as airports, were felt to be just too sensitive and so uh, they were restricted. And along with that, uh, shortly following uh, the war, or at least the U.S.'s entry into the war, curfew was established, kind of dawn to dusk curfew to keep uh, supposedly dangerous elements off the street uh, during the evenings. And I think what really concerned Gordon was um, Aliens um, who did not have U.S. citizenship were subject to this. But apart from that, only Japanese Americans were also included in these uh, curfew orders. In other words, German Americans, uh, Germans, uh, people of German ancestry with U.S. citizenship were not affected. Italian Americans were not affected, but the second and uh, some third generation Japanese Americans, because there weren't many, mainly second generation Japanese Americans who did have U.S. citizenship were subject to the curfew as well, and Gordon objected very much to that. Plus, when the orders for removal of all persons of Japanese ancestry and even part Japanese ancestry came up, Gordon felt that that was uh, unconstitutional as well. But I would also add that he was a Christian, our family. Uh, was uh, uh, a Christian family. Uh, my grandfather became a Christian even while he was still in Japan. And so Gordon had both constitutional, but I think also moral and religious reasons for objecting to both the curfew and the exclusion. What was the incident that led to the court case? The famous incident is that uh, Gordon, as usual, was studying in the Suzalo Library there at the University of Washington, and I guess at the appointed hour, which I think was probably around uh, 8 p.m. or so, uh, he would have to go back to uh, the dorm, probably Eagleson Hall or somewhere like that, um, in order to fulfill the uh, provisions of the curfew order. And as the story goes, uh, one time he got up and, and started to leave, and upon reflecting on why he was going, felt that it wasn't right, that he had done nothing wrong, that he was an American, 
and I understand he went back to the library, sat down, and there was much consternation among amongst his classmates, saying, "Hey, Gordy, uh, what are you doing here? You know, it's." And you when you say be, classmates, uh, do you mean white classmates? Well, he belonged to uh, the YMCA, and so just looking at photographs of his uh, 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 classmates, his uh, fellow YMCAers. I think it was uh, uh, predominantly Caucasian, but there were other Asian American faces uh, in there. And uh, I think his roommate at the time, Howie, was uh, 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 Caucasian. Uh, but they were all his friends and, and very concerned when he showed back up in the library and they said, hey, Gordy, what are you doing here? You know, it's after hours. Uh, what are you doing here? And uh, um, he asked them, well, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, we're here studying for the exam that's coming up next week. And, he, and Gordon said, well, I'm here doing the same kind of thing. And it was a principled stand. He did this intentionally. And I think that uh, because of his participation in the YMCA, uh, because he was already a Quaker, uh, because he was already involved in anti-war activities on the University of Washington campus, um, he uh, evolved the decision that he was not going to go along with this, but also that he was going to challenge uh, the constitutionality as well as the morality of both the curfew order and the order for removal. Did he get arrested in the library? No, he did not. What he did was he dutifully recorded uh, what was going on, including his coming back to the library uh, after hours, so to speak. Uh, he made contact with a lawyer, and they uh, decided that they would report to the local FBI office in Seattle with the diary, with, with direct evidence that he had violated curfew and that he would present himself uh, as objecting. So he made that decision. Uh, I think at that point already Arthur Burnett, a uh, fellow Quaker, was his lawyer. And, and I might add that uh, the Quaker dimension to Gordon's resistance um, is very much a part of this, this whole deal from the very beginning. Um, Professor here at Bayashi, this is this is 1942. This is a time of, of, uh, of war, patriotism, I guess, Absolutely. and internment camps for Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that uh, there was a pretty immediate removal of people in the Seattle area, and that would be from Bainbridge Island, where um, Issei pioneers had settled, were farming, and uh, we're right out in the middle of Puget Sound, so to speak, and on the waterways. And that was very sensitive. Uh, I think anybody in that kind of situation, uh, down here the equivalent would be a terminal island, where they're on the waterway, they're around naval uh, and other um, sensitive installations. So I think uh, as early as March, uh, people are removed from these sensitive areas. Fishermen, of course, are, are picked up as part of the Justice Department sweep uh, on the community immediately following Pearl Harbor. And um, I think it was very brave of Gordon in that sense. Uh, all these measures are falling into place uh, for protection for national security. Um, curfew, I think, is, is understandable in, in that kind of circumstance, I think that the, the, the principle for Gordon was why are uh, Japanese Americans who are U.S. citizens also being singled out along with the Japanese, German, and Italian aliens? How did the court case Hirabayashi versus the U.S. play out? It's very interesting because the curfew issue was uh, certainly there in the beginning at the local court, as was the challenging of um, removal. So both of these charges were initially filed against Gordon at the local level. And he was uh, fairly quickly, he spent about uh, uh, five months in jail, by the way. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is that when he landed in 
a